Stand by. We're going live. We're going live. Hello everyone and welcome to 10 Seconds to Air. I'm Alita Guillen. There is nothing like getting together with some friends and having a good old belly laugh or watching a show and being all by yourself and just laughing out loud. Laughing is more than just a physical response to something funny. Laughter is an antidote for anxiety, stress and other health issues. Studies show that people who have a sense of humor actually live longer. Laughter is also a way for us to communicate with each other. It breaks social barriers and builds connections with others, even when we don't speak the same language or have the same views. So how do you know if you're laughing enough? And what about laughing more? Is there such a thing as a laughing practice? My guest today is an international best-selling author and a positive and well-being expert. Roz Ben Mosher has spent over two decades researching, writing, and teaching about the benefits of laughter. She is an adjunct lecturer in the School of Public Health and Psychology at La Trobe University in Australia, where she teaches positive psychology and the world's first laughter, resilience, and well being short course for professionals. Roz Ben Mosher joins me now to get us laughing more. Hello there. Hello. <laughs> Lovely being here. Thank you so much uh, for, for joining me. I have to say, I really have no idea where this conversation is going to go, but I think I'm going to laugh or I want to laugh. That's just, <laughs> I'm feeling that. And there you are laughing already. I know it's it's early over there in Melbourne. Um, have you had a few laughs already? How does your day get started? How does my day get started? Usually taking out um, our Labrador. <laughs> so that's always that's always a good way to start the day. Um, checking messages as well, which I don't do first thing, but I, I do get into. And generally, I, I only check the messages that I know are going to put a smile on my face. Uh, well, how do you know that? How do you, I, I want to do I, that. I only check like friends. Like I wouldn't, uh, I'd leave the ones that, oh, I'm so sure about that. But if there's a, there's a message from someone that I've woken up to, it's like, oh, how exciting. I wonder what's going on with them. <laughs> right. So you teach, you write, you do these interviews. What goes through your mind 10 seconds to air? I, I get a sense of excitement at the possibility for connection. And especially if it's a visual sort of medium, so whether I'm speaking to you or an audience, I'm, I'm really excited about the possibility of a shared smile or a shared laugh and and even that sort of aha moment that that you get, you know, when you're talking and it's like, ah, oh, you can sort of hear people's cogs in their brain um, working. Uh, so, yeah, it's really about that shared connection. How did we do so far? We're at the beginning, but how are we? I think we've done pretty well, Lisa. I think I think we can be pretty. <laughs> okay. You've got a great smile. You've okay. got the laugh happening. I okay. give you a ten out of ten. All right, so far so good. So we can keep going. Excellent. <laughs> we can keep going. We can keep going. How did you get into this? Well, it's not like I sort of woke up one day and thought, "Oh, I'm going to become a laughter therapist." Um, it was actually, you know, at one of those sort of forks in the road. I'd spent many years actually not particularly well with chronic fatigue syndrome, and I developed uh, lots of food allergies and intolerances. And I'd sort of really started investigating food as medicine. So, twenty something years ago, I actually was writing gluten-free, dairy-free, vegan recipes and really researching that to help my own well-being and I realized how powerful it was. And I sent off um, a manuscript to a few publishers, you know, to publish this recipe book. And this is back in the like 2001. Mm -hmm. And the response was from the publishers, mm, there's just not that much market value in these type of recipe books. So mm -hmm. Alita, Bottom line is, is that we could have been speaking as me being the queen of gluten-free, but that was not to be my destiny. <laughs> so I thought, oh, that's a shame. Um, what, what next? Um, and I could have continued writing recipes, but I knew inherently that there was something more to well-being than just what we ate. And I decided I would go back to do some post-grad studies in, in well-being. 
And one of the courses that came up, they said, sure, we'd love to have you. However, you don't really have that much experience. Go get some experience in the field and then come back to us. Mm. And as luck would have it, there was a World Health Organization health promotion conference in Melbourne, and I volunteered as a rapporteur. And in between all of the marvellous sessions that I was like, oh, my gosh, I found my place, there was a 30-minute laughter yoga session. And I thought, this I had to report on. So, of course, I went along with my notepad and pen and, I mean, what was I thinking? You can't write about laughter. You need to experience it. And that's what I did with these sort of 70 plus people in the room. And, you know, initially it was a bit awkward, you know, simulated laughter exercises, deep breathing, clapping, ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. What the hell was going on? Yes. But what the hell was going on was is that these incredible moments of connection, this incredible health this health bounce that I got um, from the 30-minute laughter yoga session that I had not received in any of the years, you know, going in and out of specialist offices. So I went back to study knowing I'd do something with this laughter thing, wasn't quite sure what. And really quite early on into my studies in health promotion, you know, there's a lot of talk about mental health. But really what people were talking about, you know, the lecturers were talking about was stress and depression Mm -hmm. and anxiety. And I thought, hey, what about this laughter thing? That's a real expression of positive mental health. I think it's time for me to go explore this. So I trained as a laughter yoga facilitator and began practicing on anyone and everything. Okay. I I just have to slow you down there for a second because you've talked about it twice now, laughter and yoga. Can you explain what that is? Sure, of course. Mm -hmm. So laughter yoga is a concept that came into being in the 1995. There was an Indian doctor called Dr. Madankataria, and he was a pretty stressed out medical practitioner, and he was researching about whether laughter, in fact, was the best medicine for one of the journals that he was editor of. And he found all of these papers about, you know, laughter and and all these wonderful health benefits. However, he's thinking, how can we actually translate that into the community? So he got together with a group of uh, five friends in a park in Mumbai, and they stood around telling jokes. And they had the best time. They laughed and laughed so much so they decided they would meet the next day. The group grew because, you know, laughter is contagious and it's like, hey, what's going on here? And they laughed more, more jokes. And Alicia, you can probably guess what might have happened as the days continued. Grew and grew. Yeah, it grew and grew, but there was lots of these awkward pauses that sort of, hmm, that joke didn't go down so well. And, you know, what one person finds funny, another person might find offensive or it might just go right over their head. So because humor is very subjective, right? So he was sort of thinking, hmm, whilst we're getting, you know, quite a bit of laughter, there must be a better way of doing this. And there was a particular book that had made an impression on him. um, And it talked about this concept called acting as if you are happy in order to be happy. So we thought, hmm, I wonder if we can act out laughter in order to laugh and be happy. And his wife is a seasoned yogi. And she said, and laughter is essentially breath work, right? You know, laughter is joyful breath work. You can't laugh without breathing. Mm -hmm. So what if we, you know, came up with some simulated laughter exercises together with some deep breathing, so that's the pranayamic yogic um, element, and clapping, which helps, you know, generate the energy. So it's a ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. And he thought, well, I'll give it a go. So he went back to his friends in the park and he said, come up with something a bit radical, let's give it a go. And so the first laugh that they actually tried was the Indian namaste. So hands, you know, together Mm -hmm. and looking into each other's eyes and it was just a gentle (laughs) as they went around and greeted everyone. 
And then Dr. Katari would go <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Laugh. <laughs> Everyone would join in and then they would do some nice deep breaths and then they would go on to the next laugh that, that he'd come up with. Right. Now, this was in 1995, as I say, just with a handful or so of people. Today, it has become a worldwide phenomenon. There are around 10,000 laughter yoga clubs worldwide, online, in person, in community centres, in hospitals, and it's really taken the world by storm because there's a tremendous potency in the ability to actually bring laughter to people's lives when it might be the last thing in the world that they feel right. like doing. So, you know, I've I've done some research in, you know, people receiving dialysis, you know, so that's, you know, when people's kidneys have failed. I mean, these are really depressing yeah. walks. Yeah. There's and, nothing and, much to laugh about. And you still find laughter in those moments. You're well, trying to find the laughter. The amazing thing is about a laughter or a simulated laughter practices is that your your body cannot think. Okay, your 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 body can only feel. So even if it starts off as what the hell is going on, I'm really not in the mood for laughing. If someone mm-hmm. laughs, it's contagious, and it stimulates a dose of positive well being. It mm. taps into our dose of happy hormones. So that when I say dose, that's dopamine oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. Wow. So we can't even sort of think what's going on. It's like our brain's just sort of thinking, hey, this is just fantastic. This is just amazing. I just want to go back to the yoga practice with laughter. And it starts off in the namaste. And then does it eventually go into a full yoga class? Do you have a one? Oh, okay. No, it's a bit confusing. Um, It's interesting, actually, when I run laughter yoga sessions in aged care, you know, there's a bit of a, oh, my gosh, are we going to have to get into leotards? We don't. We don't have to get into the Lululemon leotards. (laughs) That might be a good laugh. (laughs) It it can. The downward dog. (laughs) Um, It can incorporate laughter into yoga. It's not traditional. The yogic aspect is the fact that when we laugh, we're very much in the present moment of joy. Mm-hmm. So we, it's like in 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 meditation, in yoga, it's about, you know, coming, you know, back into that present moment, you know, just that sort of anchor. And it's very much, you know, that laughter um, and the breath work is what is that sort of, you know, that pranayamic, that sort of yogic aspect. So um, it's that coming back to that <laughs> all the time um, and definitely with the breathing. And it's, it's, it's nice deep breathing. It's not just sort of, um, you know, regular breathing that we've been just doing in the last sort of 10 minutes. It's really sort of, you know, sucking in that sort of nice deep breath in and then out and then once more in and then out. So then you can do the next laugh. So you've refueled. Okay. So, and then you talked about just now, going back, asking the questions from what you had just talked about, which was then you go in and you were doing elder care or or laughter in some of these situations where people may not be in a laughing state of mind or be in a laughing state of, of their life. How do you bring that in? It's a great question, and it's something that um, I really had to practice myself. So I'd been actually for many years, for many years, probably for about four years, I'd been getting very good at preaching about laughter Mm. being the best medicine, going into aged care, going into cancer care, going into dialysis. And then out of the blue, I got a colorectal cancer diagnosis. And there's nothing funny about a cancer diagnosis. And then after the bowel resection that I had, um, you know, this, you know, serious abdominal surgery, I physically could not laugh for, for several weeks. So I didn't feel like laughing and then I physically couldn't laugh. So this thing that I'd taken for granted my whole life, laughter, was taken away from me temporarily. And that's really when I got the opportunity to explore, okay, you know, it's great to, you know, to go into a group of people who feel like laughing and it feels very true and authentic to themselves to laugh about 
life. But how do you actually get this laughter feeling for people when it's really, it could be, you know, taken away from them, you know, from, you know, a cancer diagnosis or real health right. adversity or, or yeah. real life stress. So that's actually when I actually expanded this notion of laughter just being ha 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 laughter into different forms of tapping into that energy, such as reframing a challenging situation, for example, through the lens of levity, you know, finding the humour. Even if you can't find the humour now, even, you know, thinking about it in the future, do you think there might be something I might be able to laugh about this in the future? And that changes the way the brain is responding to that trauma or to that challenge. Put yourself someplace else. Don't be in the moment. Think of something in the future or in the past. It, it can be. It, it, okay. If you're struggling in the moment, okay. um, you, you can take yourself into the future. Or you can even take yourself into the past and think about a time that you might have been going through a challenging you know, time. Then you think about the moments of laughter or love or joy that was shared, so much so that it puts a smile on your face. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you have a smile on your face, that is a gateway to positive emotion. It can be a gateway to laughter. However, smiling in and of its own, you know, right is very much, you know, a symbol of positive well-being. So uh, there are many things that we can actually consciously call into, you know, to give us these sort of micro moments of, of joy, micro moments of, of levity or laughter in our day. And that's especially important if people are going through a challenging time. So say, for example, someone's, you know, lost their job. You're not just sort of going to suggest to them, you know, just laugh about it. It's like, right. yeah, right. You know, that's going to feel very toxic and insincere. However, if you, you know, working with someone like that and you say, that's that's a really challenging thing that you are, are dealing with. But, you know, are there any moments of gratitude that you can sort of pick out from your day that uh, you can, you know, just bring into your awareness? So uh, it can even be something like, you know, turning on the shower and hot water coming out and being grateful for that or having, you know, the opportunity to have just a bit of downtime to have perhaps consider what's next. You know, that's mm -hmm. a luxury, you know, to be able to have that. Or, you know, it might be, you know, having a lovely conversation just with, you know, with a friend, you know, just being able to be able to talk to someone and feel that you are heard. Those are the sorts of micro moments of levity, of joy, of gratitude, that the more we have those in our day, necessarily the less stressful ones we have. So no matter what we are going through, that is a really important practice. It's almost a gateway to get into. It is. It's a gateway. It's, it's a gateway. gateway. Um, and it's it's about setting the intent, intention. It's as I say, you know, you might want to experience a bit more humour in your day. So how can you get a micro moment of humour in your day? Well, it might just be, you know, searching for a funny meme or turning on a, you know, lighthearted podcast or a comedy mm -hmm. uh, or calling a friend, you know, even even just to laugh with a friend, you know, just to have that sort right. of go-to laughter buddy friend that you know you can get sort of that dose of, of joy. So those all sound like external things to get you to laugh. Is there anything that you can do internally that maybe you don't have a device to help you with a meme or you don't have uh, a friend mm. to tap into to help you out with some laughter? What can you do on your own to bring that to yourself? Great question. And it's a really important question. And I think it actually starts from the, from the first moment we open our eyes. And it's like, do we open our eyes and just sort of get out of bed, you know, rough and, and, and you know, you know, with so, a bit sometimes, of sometimes that happens, yeah. Roz. <laughs> yeah. Or do you say, hey, I don't know what's what's going to be today and you know today what well, yesterday wasn't that flash but you know just actually placing a heartfelt smile on your face Sometimes. it actually sends a signal to your you know to brain it's like hey sense of ease sense of well-being and then that smile that you have placed on your face that's been an internal internally generated one you're more likely to share that with your partner your child or whoever you next come you know into 
contact with than the grimace. So we can actually start to share the ripple effect of a smile. Now you're asking about laughter, and I think that's a really important question because there is a certain vulnerability to laughing out loud. You know, children oh. don't think about laughter, right? It's like right. <laughs> everything's yeah. funny. Uh, but with adults, you know, we get conditioned. Is it appropriate for us to laugh now? Sure. What will people think of us? You know, I'm in a serious job now. I can't be looking like I'm having too much fun. However, we need to ensure that we do timetable moments of laughter. And there are some days we need that more than others. What does that mean, timetable? What does that mean? I'll give you an example. So it's not leaving it to chance. It's too important. So say, for example, we are driving to a meeting and we're running a little bit late and there's another damn traffic light and it's red. So rather than sort of, you know, really sort of start swearing at the traffic traffic lights, reframe these traffic light moments as opportunities to breathe more deeply, to smile, and mm -hmm. even to laugh. And the amazing thing about laughter is, is that it doesn't take much to actually change our physiology. So we can just intentionally choose to laugh while that traffic light is red. <laughs> Just for a few seconds. It is contagious because every it, time you laugh, I feel like I need to laugh and there's no reason. But okay. It absolutely is. Ignore me. But the wonderful <laughs> thing is, is that because it is a vulnerability trigger, if you are laughing in your car, mm -hmm. the person who walks past, the person who sat in the you know car next to you is just going to assume you're laughing with a, with a friend. So there's no shame involved in this laughter. It's a great way to actually just laugh for laughter's sake. And as I say, just a few seconds, these traffic-like moments of laughter or smiling or deep breathing, they help reduce the stress. They help sort of put a lid on those stress hormones. And it can be, you know, if people have got a regular, you know, meditation or mindfulness practice, you know, I always start, and this is something that I've done ever since I had those surgeries, those about 10 years ago now, was uh, to start any meditation practice with a smile mm. and, and then, you know, start the breathing. To be very intentional about smiling outside of, of the home, you know, yeah. walking, you know, walking down the street and sharing a smile or in your office building, choosing a new person a day to smile to. So, you know, whatever we practice, we get good at. And that's because we're actually changing those neural pathways. We're strengthening those neural pathways to sort of think, hey, traffic light, ah, wow. Two. And again, you know, waking up in the morning and smiling to your loved one rather than just, right, where's my coffee? Right, right. So these little acts that, um, you know, they might sort of seemingly seem small, but they are, you know, they're very significant and they change, they change the way that, you know, we act in time. So what is actually happening inside our body? First, I want to ask you about what's happening with me. And then I want to ask what's happening with you. Sure. But what's what's actually happening inside my body when I do practice that little bit of smile, laugh out loud for the tra red traffic light? What's happening? So, you know, there's lots of literature about what's happening when we're stressed, right? Adrenaline, mm -hmm. cortisol. So when we smile, when we laugh, we're actually tapping into those happy hormones that I mentioned earlier, that dopamine, oxytocin, which is, you know, the molecule of, of love, serotonin, which is our body's natural antidepressant, and endorphins, which are our body's pain management central. They're our body's morphine. Mm -hmm. And right. dopamine is that, that sort of hit. It's like someone, you know, someone smiled back at me. So we've got that sort of happening in terms of our neurotransmitters and our, and our hormones of well-being. What also happens is, is that, and this is why FaceTime, real FaceTime really helps, is that we've got these really special brain cells called mirror neurons. So when I'm smiling, my mirror neurons are, you know, firing and wiring. When I smile at you, that signals your mirror neurons to fire and wire. And soon we have this exchange of mirror neurons firing and wiring. That explains why yawning is contagious. Mm -hmm. Smiling is contagious. Crying is contagious. 
Laughter is contagious. You know, we need to see laughter. We need to hear laughter. And laughter is a very, it's an aerobic exercise. It's, you know, it's joyful breath work. You know, the more we laugh, the more we breathe. And we know the benefits of aerobic exercise. So we initially get that sort of bit of a peak in blood pressure and then it drops right down. So we're we're really stimulating that sort of down-regulating, turning down the stress. When we really laugh, we get a good facial workout. Yeah. Our abs get a workout and it Fantastic. stimulates our Im- immune system. So we have a lymphatic pump and, the, and it's a manual pump. So laughter is one of the things that gets that lymphatic system, you know, move, moving. Mm-hmm. So, um, wow. and then, There's a really, one of the things, you know, when I was researching my book, one of the studies that really blew me away was that laughter in the brain is very similar to meditation. So when people, you know, meditate, gamma waves are released in both hemispheres of the brain. These are very healing waves. And they found that when people laugh, gamma healing waves are also released in both hemispheres of the brain which also helps explain why when we are laughing, we are very much anchored into that present moment of laughter and whatever that means to you. We're not thinking about what just happened. We're not worrying about what might happen. Mm-hmm. You know, we For cannot present. occupy negative and positive mindset at the same time. And when we are laughing, even if it starts as a simulated laugh, like choosing to laugh for the health of it, for the joy of it. Right, yes, I love it. We are stimulating that, you know, present moment of joy, laughter, gamma healing ways. So there's a lot going on in our physiology when we laugh. And then there's a psychology of it as well. It's like, you know, if you meet a stranger, they're not a stranger anymore if you share a smile or share a laugh. Yeah, you, you know, have a it's connection a real gateway with them. to connection. Exactly. Right. right. Exactly. I mean, you're communicating on a whole nother level by sharing a laughter with someone, sharing a uh, a smile with someone. You know, here at Trader Joe's, people who are not from California often laugh when they get to Trader Joe's because the people who work there are very known to engage in conversation with you about what you're buying. They laugh about it. They smile. And people who are not accustomed to that when you first get to California say, why do they care about the ice cream that I'm that I'm buying? But they smile and they have a little chuckle with you. And now that I've been here for a long time, it's really pleasant to go in and share that no matter what your day is, However your day is going, you know that you're going to get a smile from that person and it's almost it it gives you an uplift. I mean, it does completely make sense. So you talked a lot about what it does to you, but what it does to the other person is also invaluable. You're really doing a favor to the people that you're interacting with. You don't know what's happening in their day. You don't know where they are in their life. And that bit of a smile or that um, that laughter you say really is contagious. So it's it's a gift that you can give other people, it sounds like. It absolutely is. And I love how you've just given that example of Trader Joe's. And next time in a, I'm in LA, I'm going to have to go and check it out. <laughs> but what 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 you also mentioned was is that the that they tend to have a conversation. They tend to engage with people. And that was another one of my aha moments that I had when I was researching, you know, even further into this world of laughter. This idea of the punctuation effect of laughter the conversational, um, you know, impact of laughter. So 80% of laughter in conversations is not generated through jokes. It's actually generated through just regular humdrum statements such as, (laughs) geez, it was fun catching up. (laughs) So what people are doing in um, Traders Joe's is, is that they actually Tapping into this idea of this conversational or this punctuation effect of laughter, which tends to happen at the beginning and the end of sentences. And it really helps lubricate, um, you know, this connection and, yeah. uh, and conversations. So that's another thing that I really advocate. If people are, you know, more serious types and they're sort of a bit more hesitant, you know, they don't want to give laughter yoga a go. They can't right. quite think right. about, you know, which comedian they want to, you know, listen to or watch. 
go and have a just a, a conversation with someone and you would be amazed at how much incidental laughter is drip fed throughout these conversations and it might not be as intense as you know that <laughs> but it's you know you're <laughs> getting you're still you know tapping into that dose of laughter so conversations are really important which is why texting you know lol is just never going to be able to compete right um, with the real deal of you know actually you know human connection are there different types of laughter or or, or different quality of laughter mm. and are there certain ones you should be seeking the ones that you should be seeking are the the ones that, you know, the bonding ones, uh, the ones that really connect you to others as opposed to the sarcastic ones, mm. the, the laughter that sort of puts people down, the, 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 the more divisive laughs. Oh, good point. Um, and even, you know, people often ask me, is it okay if you have a nervous laugh? Well, it's your body's way of, of trying to regulate. So, you know, it plays a role. However, the, this idea of this self-enhancing laughter, so laughter that enhances yourself and others um, is the one that we should aim for. So that really unifying laughter. Oh, um, interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there, are there people that just can't get there? Do you ever come across people who just can't get there? Yeah, a couple of, it's interesting, you know, I've been in this industry, <laughs> industry, um, <laughs> for a couple of decades and genuinely there's only been a couple of people and, and off after, you know, for example, a laughter yoga session that I facilitated with them, they've actually come up to me afterwards and said, listen, it's, it's something that I'm really struggling with. And mm -hmm. generally there is a backstory, you know, that's sort of like almost like an it's just the inability to, you know, let let your hair down metaphorically. Uh, however, when you when you take out the humour, it's actually easier to get to these sorts of serious humour doomer types than, um, you know, trying to sort of share a joke because it's, you know, um, there is there is you know something that I have definitely experienced is is that when I do facilitate a session. For a new group, uh, you know, especially if they are, you know, more serious types like lawyers or something, uh, you, you really have to. Lawyers don't laugh too much. Is that what you're saying? The lawyers don't really laugh. <laughs> well, initially, <laughs> you're it's calling them the, all out. Right, idea now. of laughing for no reason is just like because there's, there's the rational brain saying, "Hold right. on a second, what's going on here? <laughs> what you want me to just? <laughs> there's nothing funny happening here." However, it's about you know explaining more broadly what's going on in the body and dropping that resistance as much as possible, choosing to laugh for, you know, for the joy of it, for the health of it, for mm -hmm. the connection of it. And knowing that, you know, reminding everybody that the body cannot think, the body can only feel. And when it's feeling laughter, it's still tapping into all of those health benefits uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, would be happening if if I was the funniest comedian in the world. Mm -hmm. Are you a funny person? Do you tell jokes? I think I am. <laughs> my, my family begs to differ. I'm really good at mum jokes. <laughs> right. So what happens when you have a bad day? Uh, what happens when I have a bad day? Uh, well, you know, again, it's sort of... <laughs> We all have a choice. Do we succumb to sort of that victim, you know, woe is me, I've had a bad day, uh, I'm just going to think about everything that's gone wrong in my bad, you know, in my day, the thing the thing that someone said to me and go down that rabbit hole or do I put a little bit of a, hold on a second, you're going down that rabbit hole. How about thinking about, you know, what, what I'm grateful for, uh, you know, or just thinking, okay, I actually think I need to just breathe and smile. Mm. I just know that that's going to change the way I feel. Or, um, you know, I don't really feel like going for a walk, but I'm going to go for a walk and I know that I'm going to pass people and I'm going to, you know, engage with them in, in some way or another. Mm. So it's, it's really every day, every moment we actually have a choice, you know, how we respond. Do we just sort of let, you know, be passive, you know, not really do anything, you know, intentional to change the way that we feel and to change our physiology? Or 
Um, you know, and sometimes it can be things, um, you know, if I'm going through a challenging time, it actually can be picking up a pen and thinking, okay, how can I reframe this particular challenge through the lens of a positive emotion? And there are lots of positive emotions okay. to be, you know, that you can choose off. So how can I reframe this through the lens of awe? Or how can I reframe this through the lens of humour? How can I reframe this through the lens of gratitude? And, and you know, as I said earlier, if you're struggling to find something in the present moment, go a little bit further in your, you know, future mind to sort of imagine what might you be able to be grateful for or what moment of awe might present itself. And your brain cannot differentiate between what is happening now and what it's imagining is happening. Mm -hmm. So it's a really important strategy. Essentially tapping into your own endorphins, your, your, the things that, you know, give you that sort of warm, fuzzy feeling that make you feel good inside, you know, connecting to those. If you're an, you know, uh, person, you know, say, for example, you have grandchildren, you know, thinking about your grandchildren or thinking about, you know, a holiday that you really would love or that you may have had in the past, mm -hmm. you know, with, with a loved one. And that takes your mind back exactly to that time. Unfortunately, the same applies if you continue going back to, oh, that stress, that, you know, that awful right. encounter that you right. had. That's where your brain's taking yeah. you. That's saying, hey, let's, let's go and release those stress hormones. Once again, it seems real to me. So we're actually mm -hmm. hacking the system. Right. We're choosing intentionally to tap into our endorphins, to tap into our serotonin you know, through the things we're grateful for. And it doesn't take much. It's these micro moments. It's not, you know, and especially if we have had a really challenging day, we're less likely to be thinking or, you know, challenging phase of life. We're not going to be thinking about the overseas trips or the, the huge birthday celebrations. We have to bring it back to basics. Right. But that doesn't matter. It's still changing, you know, tapping into that source of, of goodness, that source of positivity and changing our physiology in a very real way. Mm -hmm. I just want you to finish your story that you started when you were diagnosed with your cancer. Um, you said that you had a lot of trouble laughing because you just physically couldn't do it. Correct. How did you how did you get through that? Well, I can't exactly say it was a walk in the park. Um which is however, which is good for was, us to know, you know, because it, it yeah, makes no, you listen, human, not, you know. It's like I am I am. It's not like, hey, yeah, it was fine. And yeah, yeah, I just smiled and laughed about it and you know, everyone can do that. Far from it. Yeah. It was definitely the most challenging thing that I've ever had to deal with. However, that was really the beginning of my exploration into this idea of the laughter effect. So because I physically could not laugh for mm -hmm. several weeks because I didn't feel like laughing, I actually had to ban some of my friends who I knew would make oh, me laugh. No. Oh, no. me from several times. Oh. But what actually happened was day eight after this full bowel resection and I actually had a um, temporary ileostomy, which is a bad you were on the outside of your stomach, which processes your crap for um, several months to enable um, the rest of my body to heal. I um, was meant to be discharged on day eight. And the night before, I'd actually had a, a really harrowing night and I was really scared and I was in a lot of pain mm -hmm. and I'd already sort of like used my morphine quota and, you know, I was sort of harassing the nurse. It's like, please, you know, you know, and she said, listen, you just need to just wait another few hours. You're fine. I know you don't feel that you're fine, but you are fine. Oh, wow. And, and I just knew that my boys who were aged at that, then they were 12 and 15, were going to be coming to, to visit me. And they were under the impression that they were going to be taking me back home. And, Gratefully, I'm not accustomed to dark moods. However, I was feeling really very, very low. And the, you know, one of the staff came in um, with the breakfast tray. And in the olden days, you know, 10 or so years ago, um, they used to leave um, pencil to write down what you would like for your next meal. You know, not iPads right. weren't a thing then. Mm -hmm. 
And I and I said as politely as I could, please, I just don't want breakfast. Can you just take it away? I'm not hungry. And the lovely lady said, listen, I'll just leave it here just in case you change your mind. And I said, okay, whatever. Off she went. And I'm just staring at this tray of food and with no appetite for it. But what I did have an appetite for, for was there was a placemat underneath the food, a paper placemat with a pencil. And I thought, I have to do something to change the way I'm feeling. I know that my, my kids, Josh and Zach, they're coming in in the next hour. If they see me like this, it's going to freak them out. Yeah. So in a very narrow margin to the right, I, I fast-tracked the whole thing. I thought, I'm just going to need just the far right column. I started to map out things that I was grateful for about having had this operation. So, you know, relatively big letters. I'm grateful for, you know, having the operation in a world-class hospital. I'm grateful for my loving friends and family, for the amazing staff, for my body's miraculous capacity to heal. And before I knew it, I was mapping out another column and I kept on writing everything that I was grateful for. And it was literally this outpouring of just so many things, so much so that I actually then mapped out another column and my writing got smaller and smaller and smaller. So it was like, you know, in, you know, when we used to write postcards, you know, to our parents, if we were right, away and right, write right. big letters, dear mom and dad. And by the end, it's like lots of love. You're right. That's you run out of space. Big writing, tiny writing. And what struck me when I got to the end of the page was I was actually sitting up quite tall mm. and I'd been slouched and really in pain. And I realised I was smiling. I was actually beaming, um, to be honest, like from from like, you know, my toes to my head. It felt like I was like this whole, you know, embodied smile so much so that when the nurse did finally come in to re-administer my morphine she boomeranged right out of the room because she just assumed she'd gone into the wrong person's oh, room wow. because here was I sitting serenely with a smile and this was right. not the woman seen a couple of hours prior so what I actually had done in that process was I had activated my endorphins now endorphins are 30 times more potent than the synthetic version morphine. So literally mm. I had bought myself pain-free time. And this was a real sort of gateway into this idea that with practice and intention, we can transform the most challenging moments by, as I say, really pausing and absorbing into this, you know, gratitude was sort of the gateway for me. And then um, once I left hospital and still couldn't laugh, I would do a dedicated smiling meditation. So mm -hmm. the smile, you know, would start, you know, in my, um, on my face, I'd, I'd move it to my heart space. And then I'd allow this sort of energy of the smile to encircle my gut or any areas of pain. And again, I just found that I would just rein in this calm, this sort of pain-free time. And a third thing that I did um, really intentionally was, you know, when you're going through a challenging time, if, you, if you're living in a family unit or with friends, it, it doesn't just affect yourself. It affects right. everyone. Everybody. And I was really conscious of the fact, especially my younger son, was really struggling with um idea of you know that obviously I'd been you know in a lot of pain and I'd been through a lot was we started you know a few weeks after my operation to have comedy evenings you know and each you know we'd get each kid to choose a comedy a different night and my husband would choose a comedy one night I would choose a comedy and slowly but surely we would introduce laughing as a family unit together mm -hmm. and that was so healing it was like in those moments, there was normalcy, there was joy. Roz, I have to ask you if this is so um, potent, you know, as a as an antidote for what you were going through and for healing. Why is it that when we go to the doctor, um, we don't get this, we get pills or 
more morphine or but no one's really talking about what you're talking about. Or is it spreading now? Do you feel like the the word is out, or are there Firstly, not enough studies to... for this? Or why there is it absolutely? That not, yeah. Oh no, there absolutely are studies. Um, the, the actual field of um, humor and laughter research is called gelatology. It comes from the Greek word yelos, and and there has been a range of studies. Initially, they were humor based studies, and now there's even a, a broader range of studies using non-humor based intentional practices like laughter yoga mm -hmm. and firstly i have to caution listeners i am not saying if you have got a particular diagnosis give up the pills and mm -hmm. laugh okay mm -hmm. i i strongly believe that laughter can be like an ancillary thing that we do that will help whatever it is that you are doing so it helps because it helps decrease our stress load when we heal better when there is less stress when we're you know got less of a stress load so if smiling and laughter can just sort of decrease that and make you you know more attuned to um you know being able to respond to whatever treatment you are on that is a positive thing uh however there are research studies suggesting especially for anxiety and depression that intentional laughter was actually had a stronger res result than waiting for you know subjective humor mm -hmm. to kick in in terms of decreasing decreasing um, anxiety and depression. So there there have been studies that have shown that you know laughter yoga, a as well as comedy, um, it, it does help um, decrease that low mood and and anxiety. Uh, however, um, it's not like you know one laugh. And you're cured. Right. It, it needs to be, you know, we need to be very mindful that uh, it's research has sort of shown that you really need about 15 minutes of laughter in your day to sort of maintain sort of, you know, that equilibrium. Did you and say 50, five, zero or one, one, five? one, five. Oh, 15 50, minutes. My God, we'd be just like, oh my God, it'd be 15 it'd minutes. Be, it'd be exhausting. And now the, 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 the heartening news is, is that this can be in one exhaustive go because yeah. 15 minutes of solid laughter is exhausting. Um, it's, you know, 10 minutes of laughter is about, you know, 20 minutes on a rowing machine. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a lot of laughter. So um, it's easier to dose when, when you're using sort of this intentional laughter because you know, say, for example, if you're doing a namaste laughter, <laughs> you, know, la you know, laughing with other people, you're going to be getting laughter happy during that time as opposed to popping on a Robin Williams comedy. And I know I would be laughing all the time, but, you know, it might not be everybody's right. brand of right. humour. So we don't know how much laughter. Uh, so, you know, but what we do know from the studies and the research is that laughter does stimulate the endorphin response. Mm -hmm. It does stimulate um, serotonin. It does reduce cortisol in I mean, staggering, you know, amounts, you know, they've done, you know, through saliva testing. So I think it's it's interesting in um, Australia and in other parts of the world, I'm not sure about the US, but there there is a social prescription that doctors are, oh. you know, are starting to take, you know, more um, – yeah, to, to, to advocate for more. And as part of a social prescription, many doctors are actually including laughter yoga or, you know, comedy or something as part of, you know, a broader community health setting, like, you know, for example, joining a cooking group. Right. Uh, wow, so that's great. That's it fantastic. It is great. It's yeah. really great. And, yeah, I think that, it's a really it's a really big question that you have because mm. you know I, I I know and it's not just me but you know through the research that there is just so much there is just so much potential with right. these practices however it does it does require repetition it does require dedication and this is when it's the trickiest is, is that most people see a doctor when 
things are not going right. well. Right. Therefore, it's not associated with a, hey, let's go and, you know, right. go for a well, laugh. Well, hopefully with these conversations, when people are exactly. listening to these podcasts, they understand that there are things that maybe just on a daily basis can make them feel a little bit better and really oh, yeah. help for their immune system and for their own health. So I do want to to get some really hardcore actionable tips to, sure. to leave people with. Um, if you want more laughter in your life, let's pick a few things that you can leave people with that they can start to do today. Okay, so this is a bit controversial. Turn down the news, have a news-free day, turn up the comedy. Why is that controversial? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound controversial at all. It sounds quite healthy. Some people think it is. It's like, <laughs> oh, my God, the world might end if I don't tap in and hear how, right. you know, dire things are. Um, so, you know, cheer scroll. I love this idea of cheer scrolling rather than doom scrolling. Find things on social media, you know, or, uh, you, you know, in, in the news that, that actually, you know, put a smile on your face, that, you know, give you hope, um, you know, that, that in, in the world. Traffic light moments, really reframe traffic light moments. And if you live in the country and there are no traffic light moments, find something else, find a roundabout moment or just find something, you know, just, you know, before you step into the shower or even in the shower, just laugh, you know. Give, give just a few seconds of laughter. It okay. changes physiology. Okay. I challenge people to have a um, an active smiling practice, you know, to choose someone new every day that you will smile with. Okay. And that ripple effect of smiling. And what that initially does is, you know, you think it's just sort of changing, you know, the way you feel, but it's that it just keeps on rippling. Yeah. Oh, I get and, it. And the more you practice these things, the more it just becomes second nature or mm -hmm. first nature, really, because our first nature is really to be joyous. Mm. And, uh, you know, just any sort of micro moments that sort of, you know, activate this positivity, you know, just looking out, you know, and, and admiring a blue sky day. Right. Uh, you know, in, right. in Melbourne, it's, it's autumn full um and you know the leaves you know appreciate the beautiful leaves or you know appreciate a you know heartfelt conversation and don't leave this to chance don't leave these happenings mm -hmm. to chance it's just too important really you know it sees these opportunities you know if for example you know with so, so there are so many benefits of of technology if you know you know that there is a person on the other side of the world that you know is going to to make you smile, FaceTime them. them. Yeah. You know, don't leave. Don't you know leave. You know even just to, you know call someone or send a text message to someone and say, "Hey, I'm really grateful to have you in my life," yeah. and just observe yeah. what what that does when you actually you know thinking about that and sensing the pleasure that they might get in receiving that. These are all practical things that we can do that really turbocharge our days with joy, yeah, um, with positivity. It. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work. Anything I didn't ask you uh, that you want to just mention before we before we say goodbye? We did get a lot in. We did get a lot in. Um, we can just have you back. Oh, that'd be fun. That I'd love to do fun. that. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> Until the next time, Roz Ben Mosher, thank you so much. I'll have a link to your website in the show notes so that people can reach out and follow all the great work that you do. Thank you again. Oh, thank you, Alita. It's been a joy. <laughs> This podcast is for information only. It is in no way medical advice. As always, consult your doctor for medical advice.